welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixon. I am Michael, and I am here alone again. Um, I guess here we are on week five, week six. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I recorded. Sorry about that. Um, this is just kind of difficult to do alone. I prefer it to be a dialogue. It's, it's just much easier that way. Um, considering we've been locked down all this time, I, I don't know if, like the rest of you, or if the rest of you, like me, are have been e- eating a lot of leftovers. This is way off topic, so I, I apologize. But um, I just, I don't understand saran wrap, I guess. I have been using it a lot more because, you know, you just end up cooking more than you need because you don't know when you'll be able to get out to the store again. And, um and so you, you, you cook it up and then you saran wrap it. And I, I don't know if this stuff just doesn't work like it's supposed to because I swear it sticks to everything but what it's supposed to. Um, I just can't get it to work. I, <laughs> my grandfather used to say you have to be smarter than what you're working with. And um, somehow the saran wrap just continually outsmarts me. Uh, I, I just don't understand it. Uh, I was talking with my mechanic yesterday because I had to put my car in the shop during all this too just to pile things on and uh we were talking about what a wonderful invention paper clips was is was is um because this is a, a tool that that can be used for all kinds of things i i use paper clips for all kinds of uh off-label um uh, uses and uh but saran wrap i can't even get to work for what it was intended so I don't know. I um, I'm ready for this to be done, and uh, and I'm ready to have uh, Liberty Larry back on here too, because um, I haven't I, I actually haven't seen the guy in like a month and a half. And anyway, um, I am. It does seem to be coming to an end. I think finally, hopefully, uh, there have been protests kind of all over the place, from the left and from the right. Um, so people are finally tired of the government telling them how to live their lives. Uh, I guess if this is what it takes, then so be it. Um, I think it has more to do with the economic side, and uh, while I I still um, am of the opinion that probably the the crash in oil prices had um, was the the thing that really triggered the economic downturn, certainly forcing everybody out of work has had a uh, uh, tremendous influence as well um, since then. It certainly didn't help the situation, right? Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we've talked about this before, um, but I'll just continue to update, I suppose. Um, so there were like three and a half million jobless claims in the first week. Uh, remembering that is 1% well, more than 1% of the total U.S. population, not just the working population. Um, so probably 2.5% of the working population, 2, 2.5% um, unemployed in week one of the shutdown. Uh, there were an additional 6.5 million jobless claims the following week, another 6.5 million the week after that. Um, and so in the, you know, in, and another 3.5 or 4 million after that. So, um, in the first four weeks of the shutdown, there were more than 20 million jobless claims in the United States. Um, just for perspective, uh, in the 18 months um, following the crash in 08, the, the huge uh, downturn in 08, um, there were only uh, 15 million jobless claims that entire time. In, in a month and a half. We've had more than 20 million in a month. Oh, I said a month and a half. In a year and a half, excuse me. 15 million jobless claims in a year and a half uh, following the 08 crash. Um, and we've had 20 million jobless claims in the month of the shutdown. So, um, I guess if you're talking about terms of uh, what is more costly... Um, and I, I don't even mean just economically. I mean in terms of health, 
um, and loss of life. I, I think it's going to be hard to determine uh, just because there's so many things. I mean, I, I started looking at mortality rates related to um, unemployment rates, and it's hard to suss out. There was a um, a big study from the um, the early 70s, the 73, the the downturn in 73, um, and it was a longitudinal study that. Um, followed people over the next like 24 years, I think it was. Um, they did 10-year follow-ups and 24-year follow-ups. And uh, they found that um, – they, they didn't give hard numbers, at least not in the abstract, and I didn't read the whole study. Um, but uh, they did um, find correlation between unemployment and, um, and a higher mortality rate. Uh, they did try to adjust for other health factors and and so forth, but that's hard to do um, because you know some of the criticisms have certainly been that uh, people with unhealthy lifestyles are more likely to make decisions that will lead them to unemployment, and um, so the uh, relationship between mortality rates and unemployment rates may really be measuring the kind of people that find themselves under unemployed or not particularly healthy in the first place and so forth. But they did try to make adjustments and. Um, just, you know, as a start, um, they, uh, their study suggested that, um, women were 20% more likely to commit suicide if they had experienced times of unemployment, um, that men were, uh, almost 40% more likely to, um, uh, have other, um, unnatural deaths. And, you know, once again, risky lifestyles may be, it, so it, it's hard to say. Um, I, I kept coming across this number for every 1% unemployment, there's 40,000 deaths. Um, turns out that's from The Big Short. I never saw that movie, and I, while I understand it was supposed to be really good, I, would, I, I, wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't follow that statistic. Um, not entirely sure where it came from. Uh, they may have been trying to extrapolate from this study in 73, but... Um, I don't know. It's questionable at best. Uh, and then I, I came across just some um, st uh, calculations. They weren't really studies. Calculations based on um, normal mortality rates and uh, mortality rates in years with higher unemployment. Um, and uh, they were finding around 1,500 people die that wouldn't have um, for every 1% unemployment uh, well, that is probably a reasonable estimate in terms of in a single year. Um, it's hard to, uh, they, they weren't applying that over time. So how much more likely you are to die from things that could have been avoided in the long term, um, as a result of unemployment, um, it isn't included. So some number of thousands of people probably die uh, for every percent in unemployment that wouldn't have otherwise. Finding that number, uh, that's for somebody other than me. But um, anyway, it's it's significant though. I mean, I, I would I would roughly estimate that probably uh, somewhere between five and ten thousand people um, die uh, earlier than they would have as a result of unemployment. Um, you know, per per percentage of unemployment. I think that we are in the last few weeks um, roughly at 12% higher than we were. So, you know, maybe 60 to 120,000 extra people die. Now, if we compare that to the, uh, the estimates for the coronavirus, um, we're at about even, but it's a different class of people. I mean, so... Initially, the mortality estimates for the coronavirus, they were saying 2 million Americans. They revised that by an order of magnitude uh, down to 200,000. Um, and they've re revised it down again since then by sixty another 60% uh, to about 80,000, um, which I still think is an overestimate, honestly, uh, the way that they're counting these things. They're... Um, they're essentially calling anyone who dies with the, who has the coronavirus or who tests positive with the coronavirus, a coronavirus death, uh, regardless of the proximal cause. Um, but, and they're adding in some places, uh, they're adding people that never tested positive, but that they think probably had the coronavirus and 
anyway, there's a lot of there's a lot of money in this available for people who can show that they've had great losses, you know, thanks to the uh, states of emergency, et cetera, that have been declared. So um, it behooves some governments to claim greater losses as a result of the coronavirus than actually exist. Um, and then you have these studies coming out of California that are talking about how um, the, as they've been testing antibodies, uh, they've found a lot higher percentage of the population um, testing positive or had had the coronavirus in the past. So they're looking at more flu-like mortality rates. Um, of course, there's some questions about the specificity of the antibodies testing. So... Uh, they may be including people that had other forms of coronavirus, like the common cold, um, maybe coming up as positive on these tests. We're not going to know for a long time, um, <clears throat> and maybe never, honestly, uh, how many people are actually uh, have actually died as a result of the coronavirus. I don't know if you can hear my cat on the other side of the door just crying to get in. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll try and wrap this up pretty quickly, although I do have a few things that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, and I, so, okay, but on the uh, games thing that I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, um, I had a discussion with an online friend about it, and he was talking about how um, the you know, the effects of the market, how, you know, the market working like it's supposed to is little consolation to the people who um, weren't able to uh, get their product marketed or whose businesses had to fold because they used resources inefficiently, you know, because they made mistakes and they, as a result, they couldn't compete with the big guys or that they didn't have the resources available to market to compete with the big guys that, you know, that the market working like it's supposed to, or free market working like it's supposed to is a little consolation to them. And I understand that for the people that lose someone as a result of the coronavirus, like these statistics are a little consolation to them either. Um, and I, it's there's always a criticism of libertarians that we just don't really care. And that's absolutely not true. We care. Um, it, it's not that the individual doesn't matter. In fact, the individual is the most important thing. But... Um, you do have to make choices that are best for the most individuals. Uh, and most of those for us come down to letting people make their own choices about their lives. Um, there's uh, Bob Dylan, um, who yeah, I had a roommate who absolutely loved. And I, I like I think his music's great. I think that he's a terrible singer. I've seen him in concert a few times. It's great shows, most of them. One of them, he looked like he was about to fall off the stage. But... Anyway, um, he said uh, one time, I think of a hero as someone who understands the degree of responsibility that comes with his freedom. And I, I think that that's a great quote from him. I, uh, there is a, a point where you have to make a choice um, whether you want the responsibility and the freedom or the illusion, I would say, um, of security and uh, a lack of choice. And... Uh, I think that at the beginning of this, people were making the choice for the illusion of security. And I hate to break it to you, but your government cannot save you from a virus. Um, and in fact, I, th I think that there's very little that the government can actually protect you from. But um, their responsibility is to protect your rights. And they haven't done a, they haven't done a great, great job of that. Um, in fact, they've done quite the opposite. So... Uh, I'm getting a little off track here. I, I apologize. Um, but now I think that people are finally starting to make the choice that I encourage, which is the choice of, uh, taking responsibility. Um, as F.A. Hayek said, uh, in, um, The Road to Serfdom, he said, uh, something like, and I'm probably going to mess up this quote, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me. He said, uh, Either the, the risk and the responsibility reside with the individual, or he is, he is relieved of both. And so you either get to make your own choices about your life, uh, take your own risk assessments, um, or you get to give all those things up. And there's a criticism of people in the South all the time that uh, from the left um, that says, you know, why in these you know, impoverished areas of the country, would they choose conservative governments when it's in their best interest to choose progressive governments because they, you know, those governments will give them things for free. 
And I think that there's an understanding down here. There, first off, there's, a, there's an emphasis on resourcefulness and self-reliance. But I think there's also an understanding um, that every time you give up, that every time you accept help, you're giving up some freedom. Um, and, you know, healthcare is one of these really obvious uh, situations where um, if you accept the government's health care, uh, for free, then they get to start making choices for you in situations like this and say, well, you know, we're paying for your coronavirus treatment. And so therefore, um, we are going to make the rule that you can't leave your house so that we have to do fewer of those treatments because it's our responsibility to take care of you and we got to keep those costs down. Um, whereas if you're making those choices yourself, you get to make those choices yourself. Um, and I, I think that that's I think that the freedom is more valuable even than security if it existed. Uh, but I would contend that the, the government does not protect you in any way from much of anything. Um, <laughs> this is uh, maybe a little off subject, but it just popped into my mind. Um, so I've been... Home, working from home a lot, which means that I've been listening to a lot more music um, and a lot less podcasts, which is kind of weird. But um, I uh, I got on this Pearl Jam kick again. It's been a long time, um, uh, but I have all these uh, these live shows. Oops, I just knocked the mic. Sorry. Um, I have all these live shows, and um, I they they put on a good show. There's you know there it's not like you know Grateful Dead level of of jamming out or even like a Mo or string cheese or something like that. Um, but they, you know, there's some good, uh, improvisation in the shows and, um, and they're, uh, they have a lot of energy and they've been fun to listen to. It's been a little nostalgic. Um, now I've never really cared for Eddie Vedder that much because he's kind of preachy, but I was listening to the show from the, the nineties when they were at their peak. I mean, the, this was one of the most popular bands in the country at the time, I think. Um, and uh, he he has this little speech about how uh, he saw some people um, taking uh, that had brought limos to the show, and that he hoped he, he that they enjoyed those rides in those limos. And uh, the great thing about riding in a limo is that you can stick your head out the window and look at all the homeless. Um, and uh, you know, so next time you're riding to the show in your limo, and you you know, I dare you to look down the alleys, uh, all those people and drink your free booze <laughs> and I thought man you're like one of the biggest rock stars in the country at this time how are you living you know it I, I don't think that he was living living the poverty lifestyle I just don't I I don't understand um so yeah that was that was way off topic but it came to mind and I'll just share that a little bit um I did uh pull a clip for this show um, this is something that we've talked about in the past, and I, I would say go back and listen to the uh, the Liberty Mike Classic on rights that we put out, I don't know, uh, maybe a year ago, close to, um, at this point. But uh, I, I'm going to stick this clip in for, um, there's a Mississippi church uh, where, on Easter, there was like a lot of this kind of thing going on on Easter. But this... Uh, Pastor recorded from his cell phone an interaction that he had with the um, the police that were um, citing people for their drive-in church service, and uh, this is one of the most frightening things that I've ever heard a policeman say. So let me throw the clip in, and then I'll, we'll talk about it. This is King James Bible Baptist Church, where Pastor Hamilton. Where I'm the pastor of the church at. This is America, private property of a church. An order from the government. Yeah. Your, your right are suspended. Our right don't come from authority. It comes from the Bible. So the authority does not have the, the right over the, the Constitution. We're talking the Constitution law. The first, second amendment, the U.S. Constitution that was given to us by our forefathers. It can be suspended. It can't. Not a military. That's a military <laughs> No, it can't. Okay. I, I know. I tried to boost the audio on the, um, the law enforcement guy's side some it, it was hard to do I, I don't know if you could hear it very well or not but the uh, what he's saying is that um that the people's rights have been suspended by the order of the governor 
And uh, and of course the the pastor Pastor Hamilton has it right. Like they can't do that. Um, rights don't come from government. Um, you know, he says rights come from God. Uh, if you don't believe in God, then you know you can. There's plenty of other philosophical arguments of the origin of your rights. Um, but suffice it to say that your rights come from your humanity, um, that you're an individual to start, and that you own yourself. And um, and if you believe that you own yourself, then everything else extends from that. <clears throat> Like I said, if you want a better understanding of that, go back to the Liberty Mike Classic. But, um, y- you know, the then the cop b- comes back and says that uh, that the rights can be suspended by um, order of the military or the the. I- I'm not sure what he says next. I-, I can't tell if he says government or governor or, or um, military authority or something. But anyway, um, this is a this is a really frightening idea uh, that. <clears throat> the government provided you these rights, and that therefore they can take them away when they choose. Um, this is not the the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. They don't provide for rights. They don't say that these are the rights that are being given to you by authority of this document. They say that um, this document restricts the ability of government to infringe upon these rights that pre-exist the government. And um, I, I think that's important to remember. A friend of mine was asking me what he thought in terms – or what I thought um, about people uh, protesting or resisting these stay-at-home orders or defying them. Um, and I, you know, while I, I hesitate to say that I encourage it, I do want people to bear in mind that this is a, a dangerous precedent. Um, if uh, authority figures believe that they have the ability to take away your rights because they choose to. Um, and it's even fr- more frightening to believe if they believe that they that it was their authority that provided the rights in the first place. So I do think that it is important to for people to, to bear in mind and to try and make sure in a polite and respectful way if a, an authority figure is um, saying things like this to you, that you try to make them understand um, the origin of rights and that they they didn't provide them and their responsibility is to protect them. They don't get to take them away. Um, so uh, it, it is encouraging at least to see people um, protesting. Hopefully we'll be at the end of this. I mean, I like I said, I was encouraging people to stay in at the beginning, and I, I guess I still do. But the truth is, for myself, I'm I'm becoming the Eddie Vedder in this. I guess um, I'm getting totally stir crazy. Uh, I, I've pretty much reached a point where I'm like, well, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, if I get sick, I get sick because um, this isn't you know this is no way to live. And uh, yeah, so. Um, luckily, the, the you know they aren't real strict about this stuff down here where I am. I mean, I've been um, you know on, on days where I get up early enough before I need to sit down at the computer and do some work, or on my days off, I've been getting out and going out and walking. Um, I go shopping a couple of days a week, uh, so you know at least it, there hasn't been a real lockdown here. Um, and I know other people are are competing with with far worse, so. But I think we're coming up to the end of this. Um, the The question is, what is going to be the aftermath? Like, how are they going to use this to infringe on your freedom in the future? Um, there's already been talk about, well, you know, what's this going to be like next year um, when we have to compete with this again? I mean, well, I guess we'll have to see. I did want to talk about uh, going back to the um, the pricing thing. Um, I did want to talk about profit and loss. Uh, so maybe I'll save that for next time. Uh, I've already been talking for like 25 minutes. Uh, that's about my limit um, of talking to uh, talking to myself. <laughs> and uh, but um, the same guy that I, a friend online that I was talking to about these pricing things, um, it came up that you know one of the one of the issues that people don't seem to understand about the free market ideal. Um, is that it's not about you know making sure that that uh, businesses profit as much as 
possible. Like, yeah, absolutely. We believe in the profit incentive um, for business. Um, but more importantly, we believe in profit and loss, that that's what keeps the market uh, lean and um, uh, and positive for consumers. And that if you are unable to compete because you're inefficient or don't provide enough value added or whatever it happens to be, that the the loss is what pushes you out of the market and makes space for somebody else. And um, this is the issue that we have with uh, one of the, well, you know, we have the issue with government bailouts because they're taking your money and privatizing it in another way. But um, another part of that is that when businesses make poor decisions and they fail, they should fail. Uh, the The risk of loss um, is what keeps people making prudent decisions or doing real assist risk assessments at the very least. So uh, maybe we'll talk about that next time. Um, I, I hope you're all still with me and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to normal. I, I keep saying this and, and eventually it'll happen. I swear um, we'll get back to normal uh, soon enough. Um, this can't go on much longer. <laughs> so, um, you know, as always, uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, uh, like and share. Um, I, I hope you're enjoying this still. Uh, I think that we're losing to um, to Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime. I guess when people aren't um, traveling around, they don't listen to audio as much as they when they're sitting at home, they watch video. So I've definitely seen a drop off in our numbers. Um, I don't know if it's because of me, because of course it coincides with uh, me doing these um, podcasts myself. But I'm not. I'm going to assume that that's not the case. Um, that the problem is that there's just we're just being out competed by other entertainment options. And uh, but remember, you learn a lot more from me. Um, so I, I hope you keep coming back, and you, you come back uh, whenever I do this again, um, when I finally get this right. And in the meantime, uh, try and stay free. Ciao.